So during the Lenten season that we're well into now, we're working through a series called Embracing the Uncertain. This is a series where we are invited to take a different perspective. A lot of times we have uncertainties about all sorts of things. This world, no doubt, is not lacking uncertainties. And those uncertainties affect us every day, wherever we are in life, however old we are, whatever experiences have been, and there's plenty of them for all of us. But we can do this and we can see these uncertainties with a different perspective. We can, through God, we can see them in a way that not only uh, gives us strength to face them, but also gives us power to really engage them and not let them shake us and not let them just lay where they uh, determine who we are or what we do. So what we're doing through this series is we're exploring six stories in the Gospels that are stories that happen just before Jesus enters in Jerusalem. So they're like little mile markers along the path as Jesus is heading into Jerusalem. And they're stories of common uncertainties. They're stories of uncertainties that we still face today. And so they're still very important, still very relevant for us to listen to, to hear, to dive into, and to try to understand. But they're also stories that show us the uncertainties, yes, but then point us literally to the cross because they're literally what happens just before Jesus heads there. And they're pointing us to then the confidence that we can have in the power of that cross and the power of the resurrection. So that there alone should be enough for us to say, okay, we can embrace these uncertainties and we can do this well. So I'm just gonna jump right in today um, to our next uncertainty. Uh, that uncertainty that we're gonna be talking about today is mortality. And outside the promise of Jesus that he's going to be coming back for a second coming, right? Like he's coming back again. Uh, he's going to make everything right. He's going to take us to heaven. Everything's going to be made the way that it was originally designed. Outside of that, because we don't know when that's going to happen, deep down in, we all know that we're not going to leave this earth, right? Like <laughs> none of us are going to make it off this earth alive. Like we're all going to die. Some way, somehow, sometime, we will all die. These earthly bodies that we have right now are not made to last forever. And many of you know that well. How many have aches and pains, right? <laughs> I just heard it this morning. I'm getting old, right? You know, our bodies are not made to last forever. They're just not. Now, I know that death is not an easy topic to talk about. In fa talk about. In fact, I will tell you, uh, one of my grandmothers, I shouldn't chuckle at this, but it was just kind of funny because I can hear her voice in my head and I can hear her literally saying these things. But she did not like to talk about death, especially her own. And she certainly did not like to talk about her own funeral. Now, my grandfather had this great idea. He thought that they should plan their funeral services out. They should pay for them ahead of time. And they should take care of all that because he just didn't want to see his family one day or have to have his family go through their grieving process while trying to take care of all of that. Sounds pretty wise, right? I like the idea that I think that's smart. But my grandmother, my blessed, wonderful grandmother, thought this was the oddest and strangest thing to do. She should not be planning out her own funeral. To think of that and that process just really bothered her to the point that she fought with my grandfather that she was not going to the funeral home to have this conversation and plan this service out. And you know what? I get that too. I get where she was coming from. In fact, my, my sister recently said to me that she has noticed as she's gotten older um, and around death more that it doesn't emotionally shake her like it used to. And she said, it's almost like I've gotten used to it. And I knew what she meant, right? It's not like we ignore it and it's no big deal because death still hurts and we still grieve. Loss still is terrible and lays heavily on our hearts. But I see it often in my profession. And seeing death and being around death more, what my sister and I discuss then is that what ends up happening is we see and we understand life differently. Like we expect that we're not going to be here forever, right? We know that we're going to be born. We know that we're going to live. And we know that we're going to die. And I think my sister and I had a, a, an early life lesson on this when our father passed when we were young adults. I was 19 and she was 22. And our eyes were opened up totally different to life and to death through that experience alone. So we're talking today about mortality, right? Because we are all going to be faced with it in one form or another. And mortality, I wanted to look up the definition of this, and, and I did it just for kicks as I was studying and to get my mind rolling and things. But it's defined as referring to the state of being mortal, basically meaning that we are human and we are destined to die. One definition I found said that uh, it's the quality, which I found interesting, the word quality, or the state of being a person or a thing that is alive 
but is certain, there's that word like underlying that, that is certain to die. In other words, we're not going to live forever. Uh, forever. That's mortality. So are you all excited about talking about this topic? Because this is great, right? Some of you are probably like, you can just wrap this up right now because I don't like talking about death either. I get it. But it's inevitable. It's going to happen to us, so we might as well just talk about it, right? Let's just get it out there. I will say that whether we are, or it happened when we were a child or maybe in our middle years or in our senior years, all of us have had or will have some moment in life where there's this realization and this mix of, of wonder of what it's going to be like after death to almost the fear of what death will be like or even how am I going to die? Anybody know what I'm talking about? Like if you had that moment where you've just thought about that a little bit, maybe it was at nighttime in the dark and your head's just wandering through the thoughts and you're like, wow, what is going to happen here? They may be moments that we would much rather ignore, but they are moments that grip our attention and make us realize that it is absolutely going to happen to me. Now, none of us know when we're going to die, right? Anybody here know when you're going to die? No. We have no clue, do we? Not one. For some of us here, it might be another 50 years. For some of us, it might be another 10 years. Maybe it'll be 10 days. Maybe it'll be 10 minutes. We have no idea when that time is going to come. And that obviously is why we should live um, and not take this life for granted. Do all that we can while we are here. In fact, we talked about in our Bible study this past week, okay, this is a little bit different topic, but if Jesus comes back for his second coming, are we ready for that? What if that happens in a year from now? What if that happens next Tuesday? What if that happens in the next five minutes? <laughs> like, would you live life differently? And I think that's a really good thought, and that's something that we should put in our heads, because that's exactly, however you say, yeah, I would live differently like this, that's exactly how we should be living right now, because we also don't know when our time is up here on earth. We don't know that. We began Lent with the Ash Wednesday service where we were reminded that we are dust and to dust we shall return. We're not gonna ignore it, right? You just can't ignore it. And it had to be this kind of feeling that I imagine that greeted Jesus when he finally decided to go to a town called Bethany where Mary, Martha, and Lazarus lived. The story's found in John 11. And just to give you a little backdrop of this story, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus are all siblings. They're all really close friends of Jesus. This is the same Mary who, in just a short period of time before Jesus goes to the cross, will pour expensive perfume on his feet, gets ridiculed for that, and then wipes his feet with her hair as she cries over his feet because she understands, Martha understands, Lazarus understands who Jesus is. They understand clearly that he is the Messiah and they understand his mission for being here, which is exactly why Mary and Martha, as soon as their brother gets deathly sick, they send for Jesus right away. They send for Jesus because they know that he's the only one who's going to be able to help him, who's going to be able to heal him. I'm going to read this part to you because what ends up throwing a little wrench into the story is Jesus' decision when he gets word that Lazarus is sick. But when Jesus heard about, heard about it, he said, Lazarus' sickness will not end in death. No, it happened for the glory of God so that the Son of God will receive glory from this. So although Jesus loved Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, we know he's got a heart for them. He cares deeply about them. He stayed where he was for the next two days. Now, some of you I know, maybe most of you, know the end of this story, but imagine you didn't. Can you put yourself in Mary Martha's shoes for the moment? Okay, Jesus knows that Lazarus is going to die. Like, he's not just sick. He's going to die. In fact, maybe by the time he got this message, he was already dead. And he decides to stick around where he's at for two more days. Two more days. Why? Why would he do that when he says he loves them, right? There's a whole other point that Jesus has here, and it's really a hard point for us to, to understand and for us to, to ponder on when we're in grief. When we are deep in grief, like Mary and Martha would be, it's really hard to understand why Jesus would do this. But it is a point that makes all the difference, and it makes a difference for eternity. And we're going to read the whole story here, and we'll, figure, we'll find that out. So he goes on um, in verse 7. Finally, he said to his disciple, let's go back to Judea. Now, I skipped a part here just to keep us moving in the story. But there's this whole scene where the disciples are like, oh, you don't really want to go back to Judea. That's where Bethany is. That's the region where Bethany is. You don't want to go back into there, <laughs> mostly because there's people who wanted to stone you just a couple days there. They're going to try that again. And, and they have this whole conversation about that. But it goes on then when Jesus finally says it's time. When Jesus arrived at Bethany, 
He was told that Lazarus had already been in his grave for four days. Four days. Okay, so he waited two of them. I don't think it's not that far apart, so it wouldn't have taken him two days to travel, maybe one. So that's why I say he might have already been dead when Jesus got the word. But Bethany was only a few miles down the road from Jerusalem, and many of the people had come to console Martha, Mary, and their loss. So imagine this now. These two ladies are, are deep in their grief. It's been a couple days. All these people are still gathering around them, trying to comfort them, trying to lift them up, right, trying to console them. And Jesus enters. And Jesus sees all these people that are there with them. He sees and knows that Mary and Martha are deep in her grief. And the first one to talk to him is Martha. Now, I don't know. When we read this, you can, you can look at it yourself. But I like to read this a little bit and think that Martha probably was a little disappointed in Jesus. Maybe even angry at Jesus. And maybe it's not all at Jesus. Maybe some of it's just at the whole situation because her brother's dead. And if you know the culture back then, women didn't just live by themselves. They couldn't just live by themselves. They didn't have jobs. They didn't have ways to support themselves. So her brother would have been supporting her and her sister. And now they're just without him. Like I imagine there are a lot of emotions mixed into this right now. But Jesus hears from Martha first. When Martha got word that Jesus was coming, she went to meet him. But Martha stayed in the house, or Mary stayed in the house. So I don't know if Mary even realizes that he's there just yet. But Martha goes out and she says to Jesus, Lord, if only you had been here, my brother would not have died. First thing she says to him, right? Not, hi, Jesus, how are you? Thanks for coming. So glad you're here. Lord, if only you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know. Here's her, her positive side. She's trying to look at it positive. Even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus told her, your brother will rise again. Yes, Martha said, he will rise when everyone else rises at the last day. Like meaning he's going to go to heaven. We know that. We got that, Jesus. That's, that's great. Doesn't help me now, but that's great. Jesus told her, I am the resurrection and the life. Can, can you hear him saying this? I picture with a soft calming voice, comforting voice. I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. Everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this, Martha? Yes, Lord, she told him. I have always believed you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one who has come into the world from God. So Martha knows who Jesus is, right? She knows why he's here, she knows he can do miracles. She knows that he can ask God for whatever. And if that's to God's will, if it's to Jesus' will, to God's will, it's going to happen, right? It can be done. But she also knows there's something greater after we die. What she doesn't know is what Jesus is going to do in this very moment. She doesn't know what he's going to do or if he's going to do anything in this very moment. But what he does do immediately is speak hope into her. Right? I mean, he could have so got right to business because we know the end of this story that he raises Lazarus from the dead and he could have just went right to that. He could have just, let's not say anything to Mary. This is what he did in a story a couple weeks ago. He didn't say anything at all. He just went right to business and got the miracle done. And he could have done that. But that's not what he does. And this is what I love about the story and what Jesus does. This is what we love about Jesus, right? Like he meets them where they are. He recognizes that Mary and Martha and all these people are deep in grief. He doesn't just ignore that. He was like, my heart aches for your heart. I often say this at funerals, that when our heart aches, God hearts, his heart aches as well. Like when ours is breaking, so is his. And Jesus sees these people that he loves, and his heart just breaks for them. In fact, the scripture tells us he weeps. The shortest scripture in all of the Bible is Jesus weeps. And it's right here in the story. He cries for them. Why? Why? He doesn't have to. He knows what he's about to do, right? He knows what can be done. But he does it because he meets them right where they are in the moment. And I have to say, Jesus came here because he not only wanted to make this miracle happen, but he wanted to listen to them. He wanted to sit with them. He wanted to comfort them, to identify with their struggles. And, and I have to say, of all the privileges as a pastor that I observe in this profession, and I imagine this is so for, for every pastor, is the moment that we get to sit with families when they're grieving. And that's not my, my best part of the job, I will tell you that. It's not my most wanting, fun thing to do. 
But man, is it a privilege to be able to sit with people when they are deep in their grief and just comfort them and just be there with them and just love on them. The time I spend with the family to plan a funeral is probably one of the most profound aspects of ministry. It's definitely one of the parts that put almost everything I've ever learned, everything that God has put together for the ministry, it all comes out into those very moments. You know, I'm, I'm a counselor in those moments. I'm a theologian in those moments. I'm not pretending to be one, by the way. I'm trying to be one. I'm trying to share the scriptures with them and help them to understand what God is doing or why God or how God is going to be with them what he's going to do with this. I don't have all the answers, but I try to share with them what we absolutely can. I try to comfort them. I try to give them compassion and support and let them know that they're not alone. And it's not just me, but it's everybody a part of this church is going to be there with them. And most of all, I'm there to listen. I'm there to listen to their stories and into their memories, these narratives that capture the family's heart and the family's memories of this loved one. And if the family wants me to give the eulogy at the service, I start by just gathering information. And I have a couple questions, and some of you know these well because you've done this with me. I'll ask a couple basic questions, but then I just ask you to share stories with me. And a lot of times there's stories all over the chronological line. Sometimes there's stories from when they're a kid, from when they're an adult, from when they're at the end of their lives. And all these stories just start flowing and they come from different family members and different family members and in one moment we can be laughing hysterically because even if I've known the person for years there are stories told obviously that I have never heard uh, there's things about these people that I still don't know and uh, we can be laughing hysterically at some of these stories and in the same breath and in the same moment just start to really weep <laughs> like weep like Jesus weeped right one of the things that I observe in almost every one of these settings and every one of these situations is that when a loved one dies, we all start to think about our own eternity. We all start to think about our own death and what's going to happen after life. Something like that, I believe, is exactly what's happening in this story with Jesus, with Mary, with Martha. The very first thing Martha expresses to Jesus is the understandable grief that she has and anger. Lord, if only you had been there, my brother would not have died. But in the same breath, in the same sentence, she says, but even now I know God will give you whatever you ask. And yes, I know he will rise. I, yes, I know he will rise in the last day. Jesus confirms her words, but he gives her so much more than just confirming, yes, Martha, you're right. Right? What does he say? He says, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me will live even though they die. So Martha's grief, she's hopeful. She's hopeful of the resurrection that's going to come. She gets that. She tells Jesus that the resurrection is actually, um, she knows that that's going to happen. And Jesus tells her that the resurrection is actually standing right in front of her. Like it's him. He's it. He is the resurrection. He is the life. And he's right here with her. Now, as Christians, when we walk on this side of the grave and we're on earth here, still alive, we live with the light of eternity in our hearts. That means that since Jesus is the resurrection and the life, that power of the resurrection and life is actually living in us. That promise of new life are not simply things that we're just going to wait to have one day. It's things that actually live in us right here, right now. That power that lives in us then shapes our hope. It, it shapes our thinking, particularly on the things like our mortality. What's our eternity going to be like? It then changes how we live. It then changes how our, our lives are every day and how we do things every day, how we think about things. And then those consequences affect other people around us. So in all, when we're walking on this side of the grave with eternity in our hearts, there are eternal consequences, not just for us, but for the other people that are around us. Let me explain here what I mean. Despite the many stories that I have been told over countless funerals, I have seen a general theme among each and every one of them. Loved ones are the most remembered, or excuse me, loved ones are not most remembered for their achievements or their finances or their possessions or however many initials they have behind their name. Loved ones are most remembered for how they made people feel. They're most remembered for their relationships. They're remembered for the way that the people in their lives now say, I know I was forever changed because this person was a part of me. They're remembered for their enduring example of following Christ. They're remembered for their legacy. They're remembered for their character, for the ways that they have made those around them better people because they love them, because they gave their love. 
which is what it's all about. It's all about love. Love is the only thing here on earth that's going to be living left from us when we are gone, right? It's all about love. So if we go back to this question, this mysterious question, the same question Mary and Martha must have had been wrestling with when they pulled the sheet over their brother's dead body, what happens to us after we die? What happens to us? I mean, we have lots of questions on this, right? That's probably one of the biggest questions I hear in ministry. What happens to us when we die? What's heaven going to be like? What's it going to look like? What's it going to feel like? What kind of bodies are we going to have? Are we going to have bodies? Are we just going to be spirits? Are we going to recognize our family that's already up there? Are we going to recognize them? Are they going to recognize us? Are our pets up there? That's another good one that I get. You know, I like to think yes, because I feel like if God made all these creations and they're so caring and dear to us too, then sure. But are we going to recognize each other? What will eternity be like? And I think it's wonderful to ask these kind of questions. And I think we should be asking these kind of questions because we have this, un, this uh, urgency to have answers for them, right? Like we want to know. It's important because we all know we're going to face it one day. So we turn to scriptures. We turn to scriptures, but only to find this wide range of what seems to be vague answers. <laughs> like God doesn't say, this is exactly what's going to happen. This is exactly when it's going to happen. This is how you're going to die. This is what heaven's going to look like. This is what you're going to do in heaven. Like it's not all laid out just so perfectly like that for us to know. We don't get a full picture of what heaven is like. And I think that's the way God wants it. Not because he's a cruel God, but because he's a loving God. <laughs> just the opposite. See, if we have a God who loves us enough and we believe in what he's telling us, we believe in who he is by what we see and read in the scriptures and what we see and know that he's done in our lives, then we have faith in him, don't we? And with faith, that's where we really grow. That's where we really deepen. And so I think God wants us to have faith about what heaven's going to be like. Have faith in him about how it's going to come for each and every one of us. Just have faith and trust in him. We get enough to know that it's going to be great and it's going to be a pretty awesome place. But we do, I know, I want to acknowledge, we still have uncertainties about what that's going to be like. So here's one clear picture that we do get in the Bible that tells us about heaven. It talks about our bodies in heaven. I just, I just want to share this with you because I share this, I think, fairly often at funerals. <laughs> and I'm not sure that everybody, especially if they're not Christian, always get it. But I still feel like it's so important to share. And it comes from Paul in 2 Corinthians and 1 Corinthians. Um, during Paul's ministry, he wrote two letters to the church in Corinth. And, and they had to be asking the same questions that we ask. They had to have these same uncertainties because he addresses in both of his letters what their heavenly bodies are going to be like. Not just what heaven's going to be like, but what their heavenly bodies are going to be like. 2 Corinthians 5, for we know that when this earthly tent we live in is taken down, that is, when we die and leave this earthly body, we will have a house in heaven, an eternal body made for us by God himself and not by human hands. We grow weary in our present bodies and we long to put on our heavenly bodies like new clothing, for we will put on heavenly bodies, we will not be spirits without bodies. While we live in these earthly bodies, we groan and sigh. But it's not that we want to die and get rid of these bodies that clothe us. Rather, we want to put on our new bodies so that these dying bodies will be swallowed up by life. That's the whole key, right? I've said recently, and, I, and you've probably heard this, and I'll just say it again, because it seems like in the last six months or more, God has just laid it heavily on my heart to be looking at some of this. And I one day was driving down the road, and I just had this moment thinking about this, and someone in the community here had just passed, and I'm excited. I'm like, yay, they get to meet Jesus face to face. It's so exciting. And in the moment, I had this thought of like, oh, I wish I was going. <laughs> like almost a, a little jealousy, right? Like I don't necessarily want to die. I don't necessarily want to leave this earth and leave my family because I know God has work for me to do here. I'm happy to be wherever God has me to be. But I still have a yearning to be in that new body, <laughs> and be with God, and have that old body swallowed up in life, right? In life, and be face to face with God. So Paul goes on just a little bit here in 1 Corinthians. I want to share this with you as well, because this is another place where he explains this heavenly body, but he does it by using the analogy of seeds in the ground and growing. When you plant a seed in the ground, it doesn't grow into a plant unless it dies first. And what you put in the ground is not the plant that will grow, but only a bare seed of wheat or whatever you're planting. Then God gives it the new body he wants it to have. 
It is the same way with the resurrection of the dead. Our earthly bodies are planted in the ground when we die, but then we'll be raised to life forever. Our bodies are buried in brokenness, but they will be raised in glory. They are buried in weakness, but they will be raised in strength. They will be buried as natural human bodies, but will be raised as spiritual bodies. So when we die, it's like our seed is being planted in the ground, right? When we are resurrected into heaven, then our seed is now sprouting above the ground. And Paul recognizes that this is a little different. We don't want to mix it up and think that the bodies we're in right now is exactly what's going to go in heaven. And that's why he also talked about the new body. Because we do know that if you plant an apple seed, you're not going to get an orange tree, right? Like that's how that is. But it is still us. It's still us. It's still our spirit just in a whole new body. So it doesn't matter if we're buried in a casket, cremated, buried in one spot or another, or scattered all around. Our earthly bodies will stay here on earth for the time. When Jesus comes back again, it's then said that all of that's going to come up. And I don't know how in the world God's going to do that because you think of people who died just 100 years ago, let alone thousands of years ago, who are nothing but dust right now. Remember, you are dust and dust you shall return. So I don't know how God's going to do that. That's up to him to do. He's the guy who can do that. We'll leave that to him. But we do know our earthly bodies stay here and we're going to have new heavenly bodies. The point is that when we die, we, we sprout up into new life into something great. And I want to share just one more piece here from Paul because he continues a little bit further. But let me reveal to you a wonderful secret. So all of this is mysterious, but it's a wonderful secret. We will not all die, but we will all be transformed. It will happen in a moment in the blink of an eye when the last trumpet is blown. For when the trumpet sounds, those who have died will be raised to live forever. And we who are living will also be transformed. For our bo dying bodies must be transformed into bodies that will never die. Our mortal bodies must be transformed into immortal bodies. Then when our dying bodies have been transformed into bodies that will never die, this scripture will be fulfilled. Death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? For sin is the sting that results in death. And the law gives sin its power. But thank God, he gives us victory over sin and death through our Lord Jesus Christ. It's hard to imagine the questions that Mary and Martha must have been wrestling with when Jesus arrived four days after their brother's death. Could all of this have been avoided? Why did he have to die? What were they going to do now? What was going to happen to them? These are tough questions, much like the tough questions that we all have about what happens after we die. For all of us, including Paul, there's a box of things that's just labeled, I don't know. And that's okay. There is a box labeled, I don't know. But just because there is a box that, of things that I don't know doesn't mean there's not a box that means, that's labeled, I believe, right? This box that I don't know may be full of lots of things. And maybe you have another box of things I do know. <laughs> But we all have to have a box that says, I believe, as well. So the things that are uncertain, the things that are unknown, we place in that box. And that's the box we trust to just let God do his thing and let God show us the way. Jesus tells Martha that he is the resurrection of the life. The resurrection is right here in front of her. And then he raises her brother from the dead to drive the point home. If we had, a tangible, if we had tangible evidence of what life would be like in heaven, there would be no need for faith. And there would be no need to trust God with that. Without faith, there would be no growth. There would be no maturity. Faith is exactly what stretches us. Faith is actually what motivates us. It's what drives us to keep going. It calls you to take the risk, to go ahead and step out onto the limb of faith that we call it, right? Because it calls you to go ahead and take the risk. And uh, it's okay to just have that box that says, I don't know. But just make sure you have the box that says, I do believe. Because Jesus asked Martha at the end of this, do you believe? And Martha's answer was, yes, I do believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, that you've come here for a reason, and that you're doing your thing. I do believe. So the question goes back to all of us then, too. Even though we have uncertainties, even though we have an I don't know box, are we going to believe? Do you believe? Let's pray. Father, we won't doubt that sometimes it's hard to just believe. Sometimes it's hard just to let it into your hands and to just trust you. But God, there is no reason for us to really do that. You have already shown us how good you are. You've already fulfilled so many wonderful promises. 
And this promise that we're going to be with you in heaven, when we believe who Jesus is, that he died our death for our sins, that he rose from the grave, that promise has already been fulfilled. And we, when we believe that, then we too will have resurrection and we will live with you forever. But God, I pray that right now, while you still have us here, that while our work is still right here on this earth, in these earthly bodies, that yes, are broken, yes, are many times in pain, while we are here, God, would you remind us that your light of eternity lives inside of us, that your Holy Spirit, your power lives inside of us, and may that change how we do things while we're here. May it be what keeps us looking forward, keeps us looking forward to heaven and to seeing you face to face, but may it also be what helps us to share the gospel with the people around us through our example, through our words, through the ways we do things. And God, may that have an everlasting effect for eternity. God, may just so many people be affected by what you have us do. So God, we believe, and I pray that as each person sits here, that we would say yes to you, but that we would also say yes to what you call us to do so that we can leave that loving, everlasting effect for others too to have eternity. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.